A day on Earth is 24 hours, or 86,400.002 seconds to be precise. That's the time that it takes Earth to spin on its axis, and that's different for every planet. For Mars, it's 24 hours, 39 minutes and 35 seconds. For Jupiter, it's only 9 hours, 55 minutes and 30 seconds. But what about my favourite planet, Saturn? We didn't actually know for a really long time. Like, it wasn't until 2019 that we think we might have figured this out. So here's how we solved, or might have solved, what was an unsolved mystery. So to measure the rotation rate of a planet, you need a reference point, right? You need something that doesn't move, like a feature on the ground that you can stare at and wait for it to come back around and time how long that takes. So for example, pick a crater on the surface of Mars and you'll wait 24 and a half hours-ish until it comes back around again. That's great for the rocky planets, but what about the gas giants with these incredibly thick, turbulent atmospheres? We could try and pick a feature in a planet's atmosphere, like a storm or something, and we could track how long it takes for that to come back around, but that's gonna move in the atmosphere in the time that it takes the planet to rotate. In the same way that picking a cloud in the Earth's atmosphere to track its rotation would be a bad idea since they move so much in a single day. So how do we do it then? Well, lucky for us, the gas giants have magnetic fields just like the Earth does. These magnetic fields are generated by moving charged particles in the planet's core. For Earth, that's moving charged particles from liquid iron in the core, and for things like Jupiter and Saturn, it's liquid hydrogen. As the whole planet rotates, the magnetic field generated inside of it also rotates with it. But the north and south pole of these magnetic fields doesn't always line up with the geographical North Pole of the planet. That's true here on Earth too. Here's the North Pole, and then here's the magnetic North Pole, just offset from it, somewhere in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. Now the same is true for Saturn and the other gas giants, and what it means is that as the planet rotates, the magnetic field sort of sweeps around like a bit of a lighthouse. Now, if there are also electrons zipping around in that magnetic field as well that have perhaps gotten there after being belched off by the sun, then those electrons will emit radio waves. Radio waves that we then detect as pulses as that magnetic field sweeps around, again, like the beam of a lighthouse. So if you can measure how often you detect one of those pulses, then you can measure the rotation rate of the planet. Great. That is if you can actually detect the radio waves coming off that magnetic field. For example, Jupiter gives off radio waves that we can detect on the ground with radio telescopes because they can make it through the Earth's atmosphere. Saturn's radio waves, though, are given off at frequencies that are blocked by our atmosphere, so we can't do this from the ground. So it wasn't actually until the early 80s that we were actually able to measure this for the first time, when the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes went past Saturn and were able to detect these radio pulses. And they estimated the rotation rate as 10 hours, 39 minutes, and 45 seconds. So finally, we had a number that we could put in the empty space that was left in Saturn's fact file. That was until 2004, when the Cassini probe arrived at Saturn. And it managed to detect these radio pulses again and get another estimate for the rotation rate of Saturn. This time, 10 hours, 45 minutes, and 45 seconds. That's a whole six minutes longer than the measurement we got from the Voyager probes. Six whole minutes. I mean, six minutes might not sound like a lot, but if you think of it in context of like maybe the Earth's day changing by the same amount, it would be the equivalent of Earth's day changing by 15 minutes. So it's a pretty significant chunk of time. So people were a little bit confused at this point for obvious reasons about why these numbers were differing. And so they came up with three possible explanations for this. The first option was that either the Voyager measurements or the Cassini measurements of the radio pulsing were wrong. That's unlikely, it's a very simple measurement. All you're detecting is that pulse of radio waves. People went back over the data from the Voyager missions, they got other independent people to look at the Cassini mission data, and it all seemed fine. The number two was that Saturn's rotation rate had actually changed by six minutes. Again, this one's highly unlikely. We don't know of any force that could slow down a planet or decelerate it by such a large amount in such a short space of time. So yes, while planets' rotations do slow down over time, it's over 
millions and millions of years. So for example, the Earth's day is actually getting longer because of the gravitational pull between the Earth and the Moon. It's actually getting longer by 1.8 milliseconds a century, but not six minutes every 24 years. And the third option is the most exciting, it's new science. Essentially that for some reason the radio emission from the magnetic field didn't actually trace the rotation rate of Saturn and we didn't really know why at the time and we needed to figure that out. And that became more and more obvious as the most likely option of those three back in 2011 when the Cassini team found a different rotation rate for the northern and southern hemispheres using this radio emission tracing the magnetic field method. All right, so there's definitely something going on here, but what is it? Well, there's two main ideas that are sort of leading the pack to explain all of this. Firstly, that difference between the measure values from Voyager and Cassini of Saturn's rotation rate. We think that that is Enceladus's fault. This is a tiny moon of Saturn, only 500 kilometers across, which is about the width of the UK or Florida or New Zealand. But it's becoming increasingly obvious. I can deny it no longer. I am small. But while Enceladus is very, very small, it is also mighty as well. From four Grand Canyon style crevasses on its South Pole, Enceladus is pumping out huge geysers of water vapor. And that H2O has been separated into OH minus, a negatively charged ion, and H plus, a positively charged ion. So that means a lot more charged particles knocking around in Saturn's magnetic field. But they're not evenly distributed like the charged particles that are burped off by the sun. These ones from Enceladus get spread out into a disk out where Enceladus orbits Saturn, kind of like a, a misty extra ring of Saturn. The idea is that this disk puts a drag on the magnetic field as it rotates, slowing it down, causing it to slip compared to the real rotation of Saturn, which we still don't know. It's thought that when Enceladus's geysers are more active, there'll be more charged particles, more drag, and the more the rotation rate that you measure with the radio emission will differ from the real rotation rate of Saturn. So if the geysers activity was different when Voyager flew by and when Cassini flew by, that would explain the difference in the measurements that we made. But what about the differences in measurement for the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere? Well, we think that's down to something that Saturn has in common with Earth, but the likes of Jupiter doesn't have. Saturn has seasons. It orbits the sun tilted on its axis by 27 degrees, which means that when it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere and it's pointing towards the sun, the Northern Hemisphere is getting hit by more charged particles and the Southern Hemisphere by less. And then when it's summer in the Southern Hemisphere, 15 and a half Earth years later, then the Southern Hemisphere gets hit by more charged particles than the Northern Hemisphere pointing away. It's that plasma of charged particles that's generating those radio signals, right? That we then use to calculate Saturn's rotation rate. So if that's changing at different points in Saturn's orbit as it orbits the sun, then we're gonna get different measurements for the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere at different times of Saturn's year. It's made me wonder how accurate are the Voyager measurements of the rotation rates of say Neptune, which also has a 28 degree tilt and has seasons, but especially Uranus, which has a 97 degree tilt, essentially spinning on its side. All right, so that explains all the weird and wonderful observations we've made so far, the difference between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, and the difference between the Voyager and the Cassini measurements. But it also tells us that we can't use this radio emission tracing the magnetic field trick to actually work out the real rotation rate of Saturn. So how did we eventually do that? Well, in 2019, Chris Mankovich and collaborators had an idea to use something called ring seismology. Saturn's rings are essentially this like really flat disk of tiny specks of dust grains. And they're really sensitive to Saturn's gravity, especially if there are any like tiny fluctuations, perhaps if there's maybe a denser clump of material in the very inside of Saturn, which as it rotates, pulls more on the rings and leaves this sort of spiral wave pattern on the structure of the rings. By tracing those patterns, Mankovich and collaborators managed to build a model of Saturn's interior, including how it rotates. And this was completely independent of any radio observations that have been done, which meant they could get a completely independent measure of Saturn's rotation rate. And they found a number of 10 hours, 33 minutes, and 38 seconds. 
six minutes faster than the Voyager probes measured and 12 minutes faster than the Cassini probe measured. And that sort of confirmed our ideas that the magnetic field probably is being decelerated some way. There's some drag force on it that's causing it to slip with the real rotation rate of Saturn. And perhaps that is due to Enceladus pumping out a load of water vapor. So it was a long time coming, but finally we had an estimate for the real rotation rate of Saturn. Now, I'm not saying this method is perfect in any way, it's what's called an indirect method because you don't measure it directly, instead you have to go through that whole step of modelling the interior of Saturn. But to be honest, we'll probably never have a direct way of measuring this, just because of the nature of Saturn's really turbulent atmosphere as a gas giant. But what we could do with is just another clever, indirect way of measuring the real rotation rate of Saturn so that we can, you know, just compare the values we get for both of them to check that we are actually in the right ballpark. Only then is when I think we can start changing all the textbooks again. And only then can we declare that the rotation rate of Saturn is no longer an unsolved mystery. Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Now, if you're interested in learning a new science subject, like astronomy, for example, then you might be wondering where to start. Now, watching YouTube videos like mine is definitely a good place to start, but also to really learn something and remember something, you need to do it. And this is where Brilliant comes in. It's a website and an app that gets you to learn by doing. You get to jump into solving problems and get coached just bit by bit until, before you know it, you've learned a whole new science topic. And there are courses in math, science and computer science for all skill levels, but I'm particularly impressed by their astronomy course, where you can learn more about how we know things about the universe. For example, like how we detect planets orbiting around other stars. So if you want to join a community of over 8 million people learning with Brilliant, then head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, that's D-R-B-E-C-K-Y, or you can click in the link in the video description and you can sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link will get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. It's thought that when Enceladus' geysers are more active, there'll be more charged particles, so there'll be more drag, and you'll end up with more of a difference between the real rotation rate of Saturn and the rotation rate that we measure using... Using? <laughs> using the radio emission. It's becoming increasingly obvious. I can deny it no longer. I am small. Well, that's down to something that Saturn has in common with Earth that Jupiter doesn't have. It has... She's... She's... <laughs> Sean Connery is back, folks. <laughs> All right, this is the sentence with Uranus coming up, so let's try and pronounce it right so as not to send the comments into fits of giggles. <laughs> 